Uh, good afternoon. My name is Joseph Fischera, and I'm uh, part of the visiting faculty at uh, the Woodrow Wilson School in Princeton University. And it's my honor to introduce to you my close friend, Patricia DeStacy Harrison, who's the president and chief executive officer of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And to bring some enlightenment to a powerfully important, though often misunderstood, issue, the role of public media in our modern society. The alphabet soup of public media that we've talked about is CPB, is the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, PBS, Public Broadcasting Service, NPR, National Public Radio, PRI, Public Radio International. While some people may think that these are all part of one giant government agency, they are not. It is true that the Corporation of, uh, 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 the Corporation for Public Broadcasting is a government-sponsored enterprise, and unfortunately a GSE, as we all know here at the Wilson School, moniker has fallen into some disrepute because of the housing GSEs like Freddie and Fannie Mac. Nor is it helped by the confusion over the different roles of the different public media acronyms. But the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, as Patricia will bring to us, is different and its role is different. It is a private, not-for-profit corporation funded by the federal government. It has an independent board of directors appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. And like all corporations, it chooses a president and CEO. Uh, whereas PBS and NPR that you are familiar with are engaged in creating and broadcasting programming content, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting is more a uh, I'll put him a financial term, more a venture capitalist for the public good and media throughout the country in both small and large efforts. It is funded by the federal government, and it's the government's investment vehicle in public broadcasting. It's actually the largest single source of funding for public radio, television, and online and mobile services. But it does not own or operate or control broadcast stations. It distributes more than 70% of its funds directly to stations throughout the country, small and large, rural and urban. Patricia is the chief executive officer and president of the corporation. And her journey, to give you a personal background, is uh, at this critical, to this position at this critical time, I think is both remarkable and inspirational because it does give hope to Americans who want our leaders to work for public good in a bipartisan manner and who believe in hard work and overcoming obstacles through vision and determination. And for Patricia, as I know, and most people do with a very good sense of humor in the face of adversity. Her success did not come through Ivy League advantages that we have had, may have here or large endowments. It was earned through skill and determination built on her core values based on an Italian-American heritage. For example, she has told many a person, life gives you lemons, make lemoncello. <laughs> and Patricia grew up in Brooklyn, New York, a place where she says that, that the definition of a conversation is people talking and waiting to talk. <laughs> she graduated from American University, first went to, to work building a family and raising three children. In addition to managing her family commitments, she also worked as a part-time journalist. And in the early 1970s, her entrepreneurial spirit took pill, and she formed a public relations company with her husband, Bruce Harrison. By 1990, she was involved in national affairs and appointed by President George Herbert Walker Bush to the President's Export Council in the Commerce Department. She chaired the International Committee, Small Business Advisory Council, Small Business Administration in 19. 1992, was appointed to the serve the United States Trade Representatives Council. Now, that continued in, because of her involvement in public affairs and with an expertise came a, a diverse set of issues. She became Assistant Secretary of State for Educational and Cultural Affairs and the Acting Undersecretary for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs by President George W. Bush. So I think that makes her a Republican. Uh, <laughs> Whether it was climbing uh, to the top of Saddam Hussein's palace or being chased by a guy with a curved knife, I'm told, in Islamabad who 
turns out just wanted to show her the knife. Uh, Patricia was an entrepreneur. Her leadership skills are uh, sound to earth and, and can be seen in one of her books that she wrote called A Seat at the Table, which is a real world business guide for women to navigate uh, the business world. As the title suggests, it's about opportunity and then achievement. And she wrote another practical book called America's New Women Entrepreneurs, Tips, Tactics, and Techniques of Women Achievers in Business, written when the glass ceilings were far lower than today. And so her practical nature is, when we asked her about how to think, get things done, she says, well, if you don't have time to smell the flowers, get them delivered. <laughs> As you can see, down to earth, real, and rigorous. Well, here at the Woodrow Wilson School, in, in this room, we have had many panels and speakers organized by the outstanding team of Elizabeth Donahue and Patricia Hilovich in following a long and rich tradition. We freely and openly discuss and debate issues affecting politics and the economy. And if you go upstairs just by the elevator, you'll see some photos about the dedication of the Woodrow Wilson School where President Johnson spoke about the goals of this institution in 1966. One year later, Johnson spoke on uh, the passage of the Public Broadcasting Act, which was created this, the Center for the, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And it was important to put in the context of, what, of Patricia's talk, it was a bipartisan effort. It was led by John Gardner, who was the Secretary of Commerce at the time, and a Republican member of the Johnson cabinet. And the president at that time, speaking, as I said, right around the, well, one year later after the dedication of the Wilson School, stated, note, pointed out, it, quote, it was 1844 that Congress authorized $30,000 for the first telegraph line between Washington and Baltimore. Soon afterward, Samuel Morse sent a stream of dots and dashes over the line to a friend who was waiting. His message was brief and prophetic and read, what hath got wrought? The president continued, every one of us should feel the same awe and wonderment today. For today, miracles and communication are our daily routine. Every minute, billions of telegraph messages chatter around the world. They interrupt law enforcement conferences and discussions of morality. Billions of signals rush over the ocean floor and fly above the clouds. Radio and television fill the air with sound. Satellites hurl messages thousands of miles in a matter of seconds. Today, our problem is not making miracles, but managing miracles. We might well ponder a different question, what man hath man wrought, and how man used his in interve inventions. Now, that was said in 1967, 45 years ago. The more things change, the more they remain the same. Substitute text for telegraph or maybe tweet, and you'll get the message, I think, so to speak. So Johnson's words, which were meant to be descriptive, were prophetic and begin the journey where Patricia will take us today. One of her former employees, Joaquin Alvarado, described her, Pat Harrison is fiercely intelligent, instinctively protective, yet courageous. She is direct and unencumbered by self-doubt. I respect people with those qualities. They encourage risk-taking and accountability. They create clarity. It is my honor and privilege to welcome Patricia DeStacy Harrison to Princeton. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for that very interesting introduction. <laughs> but before I begin, I want us all to recognize Hugh Price. And I'm so delighted you're here, Hugh. We saw each other at a very... Um, amazing gathering uh, focused on helping kids stay on the path to a high school diploma, and you had a lot to share about that. I'm really pleased to be part of this uh, wonderful series because it gives me an opportunity to talk about American uh, public broadcasting more accurately, as we call it today, American public media. And it's evergreen value, it's relevancy, to American life, even as Joseph said 47 years later. Our, it's value to our civil society, or as E.B. White famously said, why it is worth the pickle. 
As Joseph said, I served uh, before I came to, I'm going to call it CPB, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, as Assistant Secretary for Educational and Cultural Affairs under Colin Powell uh, seven years ago. And I have to say, when I started there, they were very tough days, right after the September 11th attacks. And the challenge then was how to do what some thought was the very counterintuitive thing to actually increase international educational professional exchanges uh, instead of cutting them back, which is what a lot of people in Congress wanted to do. But I'm glad that we prevailed because despite the visa challenges immediately post September 11, we ran over 40,000 exchange programs a year, working with 1,500 public-private partnerships and over 80,000 volunteers. I will get to the story of public media, but it may be serpentine, serpentine, because there is a connection. And people came from virtually every country in the world and through these exchanges, which are so valuable, and they connected to Americans in the workplace, um, in communities, some stayed in their homes. And they, of course, learned about us through both commercial and public media. And they brought with them their conceptions or their misconceptions shaped by Hollywood and the very, very loud, blaring headlines of the day. The important thing was these programs gave them a chance to tell their story and listen to ours. And Muriel Reichheiser said that the world is not made of atoms, it's made of stories, and I believe her. So at that time, there was a group of journalists from Kurdistan, and they came to Washington after spending three weeks traveling around the United States, visiting various news bureaus, and they happened to be interviewed on NPR. And one of the Kurdish journalists said, you know, we were told by Saddam Hussein that Americans hate the Kurds. And the interviewer was like, well, that's terrible. And he said, no, no, no. We are finding out you don't hate us. You don't even know who we are. <laughs> Four years later, when I joined CPB, I had a chance to fund what became a prize-winning series. And it was called Next Door Neighbors. And it was a project developed by Nashville Public Television. And the first program in the series was called Little Kurdistan USA. Nashville has the largest Kurdish population, population in North America. And this program told the story of how the Kurds in Nashville were becoming Kurdish Americans and how they were adapting as refugees and trying to overcome great cultural challenges. Now, the interesting thing is that the producers thought the story would be about religious tension between Nashville Christians and Muslim Kurds. But what they learned as they started doing these interviews is that the longtime residents of Nashville are very religiously tolerant, and that became the real story. The documentary series was broadcast on air, on public media, online, and it was made available to the world through YouTube. And I don't often get to say this next sentence, but it went viral in Kurdistan. Back in Nashville, the Kurds in the series became local celebrities and authorities to people back home on all things American through the powerful and truthful telling of their stories. And it reminded me that mutual respect and understanding will never emerge from just giving someone a brochure about democracy. While I was at State, there was a high school exchange student who was here as part of a program I created with the help of Senators Kennedy and Luger to bring young people from Arab Muslim countries to the United States for a year. Talk about counterintuitive programming, but actually it was very successful. And after this young man stayed with the family for several months, he called to say that he needed to leave his host family right away. And we asked him, why? Is the family not being good to you? Do you not like the school? And he said, no. Everything is great, but every time President Bush is on television, they curse him 
and I'm afraid they're going to be arrested. You have to get me out now. That was 10 years ago, and people are still yelling at the president without penalty, only now they're doing it through texts and tweets and on Facebook and in blogs. But as we are bombarded by 24-7 media and immediately slamming back our response, as we occasionally, occasionally indulge our fabulous tendencies on Facebook, it's more important than ever that what we're reading or hearing listening to and saying is factually informed, is true. As Jim Lear of the PBS NewsHour says, you are entitled to your own opinions, but you're not entitled to your own facts. And we have so many media choices today, channels and platforms from which to choose, that frequently I'm asked, why do we really need public media anymore? But I think it's impressive that over 170 million Americans choose public media every single month, on air, online, and through their choice, they are answering that question because we provide a unique menu, an important alternative through trusted, high-quality content that tells the story, tells the stories in a factual way through content that really does educate, <coughs> inspire, inform, and entertain. And it's really for people who are looking for news beyond a soundbite. The other night I came home and my husband was watching PBS News, news Hour with his laptop taking notes, focusing on the changing story in Afghanistan. You really have to be committed to getting the backstory, that deep dive behind the headlines when you watch NewsHour. And of course, George Shultz, 42, is it 42, Princeton 42, yeah. former Secretary of State, said that PBS NewsHour offered the best in-depth coverage he had seen covering the unfolding events in Libya. And if you're looking for a series that really takes on tough, controversial, and complex stories, you turn to Frontline. We just received um, a poll that identified the top most trusted programs, commercial and public media. The second most trusted television show in prime time is Frontline. And the first, anybody? No. Nova. When CPB provided a significant grant to Frontline, I told producer David Fanning that I expected to get calls of both outrage and support from both sides of the political aisle on a regular basis. And I have to tell you, I wasn't disappointed <laughs> because viewers are passionate about this show and they watch and respond in numbers that frequently overwhelms the uh, Frontline website. I don't know how many of you saw that doc documentary, Hunting Bin Laden. It was prescient. And subsequently, it was awarded the DuPont Columbia Gold Baton. Consistently, Frontline is honored for the best TV coverage of international events. And on a personal note, when I worked at State, I started every morning with Morning Edition, and I still do that. So that by the time I got to the undersecretary's meeting with Secretary Powell, I felt at least I had the news beyond the headline, and even the news that foreshadowed the stories in cables. And it was never dramatized. It was always informing. So I moved from state to public media. And it was interesting because I moved where mutual respect and understanding were values to public media where I found a similar mission where listeners and viewers are treated as citizens and not consumers especially in terms of our commitment to both journalism and education. Two weeks ago, something like that, um, at the Institutes of Peace, we presented this year's Edward R. Murrow Award to NPR international reporter Lourdes Garcia Navarro for her integrity and her courage in reporting from Egypt and Libya and Lebanon and Syria. And one of the untold stories is that so many of NPR's international reporters 
uh, women. And often, of course, they're in harm's way. They're on the ground before the story breaks. And this reminds me of what Edward R. Murrow said when he was talking about public diplomacy, but I think it's particularly applicable uh, to public media's journalism. Murrow said it's important we're there for the takeoffs and not just the crash landings. Covering the world, as Lourdes said, has never been more dangerous and more vital. And NPR has made a commitment to keep their foreign bureaus going. I don't know if you're aware of this, but commercial media are downsizing or even closing theirs. So this is really journalism that's worth sustaining. And it's a key component of that evergreen mission, telling America's story, telling the world's story to America, and getting it right. Public media is also getting it right through our decades of commitment to education, ensuring that kids, especially in high poverty communities, are ready to learn before they enter kindergarten. You know, a lot of times we're um, accused of being elitist, that public media is just for the very wealthy and the overeducated. And clearly people who are uh, saying these things are not really aware of the depth and breadth of the history, the foundation of education of what we're doing. The children's programs have been measured and evaluated, proven to actually getting these kids ready to succeed in school, to give them that head start. And now we are providing a safe place where children can learn online. Now, unless you have children, you wouldn't know that PBS's educational content for kids is now on multiple platforms. And through PBS Kids Go, to me this is an astounding statistic. They are watching 114 million educational videos a month with content in both English and Spanish. Doesn't mean they're just sitting there. Their parents are sitting there as well. And we get letters and emails from some of these parents who are telling us they've learned English watching PBS Kids Go or Sesame Street. From the early days of Sesame Street, our educational content and the way it is de delivered has changed to ensure it's relevant to kids and parents today. So. When my kids were little and they were learning through Big Bird, different letters, it was how to get along in the playground, those kinds of things. But today, what these Muppets are doing, these trusted characters, uh, helping kids cope when parents don't have a job, when they lose their home, or when parents are deployed. The fact is they've been helping kids cope for a very long time. They've been teaching kids and talking to kids, and the important part of Sesame Street is that this kind of relationship takes time. It's based on building a relationship of trust with very, very young children and their parents. And here's my commercial. <laughs> so to interrupt that kind of trusted conversation with commercials would not be a good thing. Just think about that a little bit. So while our content is king, we're always innovating, ensuring that we constantly connect with the people formerly known as the audience. We test results and we use educational content and services as both a lab and an incubator. And just this week, the chairman of the FCC, Julius Janikowski, praised public media for being technologically innovative. William Gibson, the author of Neuromancer, said, the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed. So today we're connecting with a digital generation that is accessing our educational content at younger and younger ages. And our mission through children's educational content is to help all kids, not just the ones living in the wealthy zip codes, to shape their own future. Now, while we are on iPod and iPhone, all of our content is uh, on those devices for free. We can get a little swayed by the technological toys and forget that as we do work with teachers and we're getting this content 
to kids beyond the classroom, we should remember that not everyone has broadband and public media is delivered over the air uh, for free to millions of American families. And that is so important. Sometimes we forget, <coughs> really forget, what a meaningful service this is. Now, as Joseph mentioned, I grew up in an Italian-American family in Brooklyn, New York. The neighborhood was predominantly Jewish and Italian. And Brooklyn, at that time, was a place where teachers ruled. So no matter what your heritage, if you came home from school with a B, the universal response from all parents was, so who got the A and why wasn't it you? My grandfather was a barber and he came to this country at the age of 12. He never graduated from high school but somehow managed to become the unofficial mayor of Bay Ridge, which was a predominantly Italian neighborhood and he felt a responsibility to help kids stay on the path to a high school diploma. But his technique was interesting, somewhat flawed. I remember him yelling at the young men as he cut their hair, don't be stupid, stay in school, graduate. You come from Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci and Julius Caesar, don't embarrass them. <laughs> They just looked at him. Uh, <laughs> we got our news then through television, radio, and newspapers, and at the time there were at least five newspapers in Brooklyn. The libraries, not bookstores, were where you got your books, and I think I'm still on the wanted list, but not returning catcher in the rye. Mm -hmm. Now television at that time was a series of commercials interrupted by the story, and we thought it was great. But in 1961, Newton Minow, then the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission gave a very famous speech at a convention to the National Association of Broadcasters. And in the speech, he referred to television as a vast wasteland. He said, and remember, this was 1961, so just when you're thinking things are really bad, let me take you back then, give you a brief headline what was going on. He said, in today's world with chaos in Laos and the Congo aflame, with communist tyranny on our Caribbean doorstep, relentless pressure on our Atlantic alliance, with social and economic problems at home of the gravest nature, and with the technological knowledge that makes it possible not only to destroy the world, but to destroy poverty around the world, in a time of peril and opportunity, <coughs> the old complacent, unbalanced fare of action, adventure, and situation comedies is simply not good enough. And this was way before Cable and the Kardashians. <laughs> he told them, it was not enough to cater to the nation's whims. You must also serve the nation's needs. Minow later said that the two words best remembered from his speech were vast wasteland, but the two words he wishes were, would be remembered are public interest. So Joseph took you through most of this. After that speech, there was a Carnegie Commission on Educational Television. They published a report. The president recommended the creation of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. In turn, CPB created the Public Broadcasting Service, known as PBS, more initials, and National Public Radio, NPR, in 1970. The important thing to remember about the difference between all of these um, initials is that CPB, we do not produce programs. Our goal is to strengthen and advance public media. The other important thing is that we provide a firewall of independence between our funding and the editorial judgment that producers make. And this is really, really important. So while we provide the money, we have no editorial oversight whatsoever. And that keeps public media, I think, uh, unique in many ways. Now, we're off to a good start. We have public media, we have the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, we have PBS and NPR, and the commission recommended that we be funded with more than $100 million a year in operational funds. And Congress listened very intently and gave us $5 million. <laughs> We've been fighting for funding ever since. 
CPB, our job is to serve as the steward and manager of the federal funds. And as Joseph said, by statute, over 70% of our funding goes directly to 1,300 public radio and television stations in communities across the country. Now here's where it gets kind of complicated. They get the money, but they can't get the money un unless they can show that they have support from the community. So even though they need these monies for local operations and to produce and acquire programming, they have to then, I would call it almost getting a report card from the community. Are they serving the community in a way that brings forth the support that they need? And they're serving 90% of the American people in rural, urban, suburban areas, but also on Indian reservations, in remote areas of Alaska, on Guam and Samoa. And this is all with high quality educational informational services for free. So as you look at public media today, you really have to come away and take that 30,000 foot view and say it's one of the most entrepreneurial services and one of the best examples of a public-private partnership. The federal funds that go to the stations are vital, sort of like the yeast that enables them to go out and raise the rest of the money. However, they represent 15% of a station's total budget, which means that stations must raise a great deal more. And they do it through businesses and state and local governments, individual contributions, the largest source of non-CPV funding. But it doesn't end there. The story of public media is that for every dollar they receive from the federal government, they raise six times that amount. This public-private formula model means that today's public media is available to all Americans for approximately $1.39 per taxpayer. And that number isn't exactly accurate. It's really lower than that, but on an average, it's $1.39. So if we were to take a look at public media in other countries, we're paying far less, for example, than $28 Australians pay for their public media service. Or the Canadians, $32, Japanese, $63, and the UK has the highest level, $85. But the fact is that a foundering economy has impacted financial support for public media from states, financial, uh, fi uh, states, foundations, businesses, and individual contributions. And some states are cutting funding, including right here in New Jersey. At the same time that state governments are cutting funds, the Federal Communication Commission's National Broadband Plan advised that we must continue expanding beyond our original broadcast-based mission to better serve the new multi-platform information needs of America. But then the critical sentence, in order to achieve these important expansions, Public media, they said, will require additional funding. But before we even get to the issue of an increase in funding, the larger question of federal funding in general for public broadcasting continues to be debated. Now, there are some who believe that the government should not be funding <coughs> public media at all. Stations should just raise the remaining 15% through advertisements, for example. And just last week, potentially adding fuel to this argument, a Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals decision held that the prohibition against the broadcast of political and public issue advertisements by public broadcasting stations was unconstitutional. Now that may go on to the Supreme Court. But in the meantime, the Justice Department arguing on behalf of the FCC responded with this statement. And this is really at the core. If public, they said, if public television and radio stations become financially dependent on advertisement, stations would replace their niche educational programs with more popular programs which have greater mass market appeal. 
thus endangering the broadcast of the educational programs <laughs> for which public broadcast stations exist. In other words, the federal dollar plays a crucial role ensuring the very existence of public media as we know it. Content that is created with the public in mind, not the bottom line, but for the public good. This content was always meant to be and is a counterpoint to what may be offered on commercial television or for through subscription fees through cable. So let me give you an example of a mission-focused, only available in public media series without commercial interruptions that's going to be coming up. It's a four-hour television series for PBS and international broadcast shot in 10 countries, Cambodia, Kenya, India, Sierra Leone, Vietnam, Afghanistan, Somaliland, Pakistan, Liberia, and the US. And it is based on the best-selling book, Half the Sky, by Nicholas Kristof and Cheryl Lou Dunn. This series introduces women and girls who are living through very tough times, and the issues are not easy to watch. Sex trafficking, violence, maternal mortality, health and education roadblocks. But the stories of these women and girls are inspirational, and they really are about the power of public media to affect positive change by telling these stories to the world. Half the Sky is part of public media's Women and Girls Lead initiative. It's really going to be television worth watching. It'll be on air, it'll be online, on multiple platforms, and the storytellers, these amazing women from all of these countries, will be engaging with audiences throughout the world. So where do we stand among all this controversy in terms of yes or no to public media? In a recent bipartisan poll conducted by Heart Research, 70% of American voters, including those who self-describe themselves as Republicans or Democrats or Independents, support continual, continued federal funding. And the same poll shows that Americans believe PBS to be the second most appropriate expenditure of public funds, second only to national defense. So there are good reasons why those 170 million Americans connect locally and nationally and globally through public media every month. For thousands of families, it's really what I talked about, are educational programs that really can determine um, a child's success in school. For some, it's NPR and the trusted journalism they provide. For others, uh, it's the films of Ken Burns telling America's story through baseball and jazz, the Civil War, the war, the national parks, and now the Dust Bowl. Or Dr. Lewis Gates, African American Lives, Finding Your Roots. Or the compelling films by Stanley Nelson, Freedom Riders, or Slavery by Another Name, which was viewed by five million people the night it debuted. Or Nova and Nature, Eyes on the Prize. And then, of course, the blockbuster, Downton Abbey. For a majority of Americans, though, it's a combination of national and local programming, the local connection to stations like Marfa Public Radio. This is literally a three-person station in Marfa, Texas. I'm sure Google Map has Marfa somewhere, but it is a very small town. And this station was the only source of information about road closures, evacuations, and weather conditions during the largest fire in Texas history last year. And the community turned out to recognize the station for saving so many lives. For others, it's StoryCorps, Peabody Award-winning program heard by 1.5 million Americans each week on NPR. Marissa Mayer, Vice President of Google, said content creation is not a commercial act. It's a social act, and Americans have faith in their own story. They want their own story told. Story, was cre story core was created by David Isay right after September 11th so that people would have a chance to tell their stories of loss and courage, share and hear these stories on NPR. And we have funded the Traveling Story Core booth as it's gone through the country giving over 80,000 Americans the chance to record interviews about their lives. And 
two people go into the booth and one asks the question. And it's really a, a very moving experience and then to, to listen to it. Or you, you have people talk about what it was like to be fighting for civil rights in, in the very beginning or a new immigrant to this country and teachers who've made a difference in the lives of students. So I thought, pull a few strings and have my mother interviewed. I would interview my mother. My mother's 97. And they give you some guidelines with the questions, but basically you just want this human kind of exchange. And I started talking to my mother, and it was OK. And then it was done. And they give you a, a CD when it's over, and it goes into the Library of Congress. So we finishing up. My mother said, no, that was just the rehearsal. I want a do-over. I had to tell her there wasn't a do-over. That was it. She said, well, I would have talked about other things, and I would not have given my real age. <laughs> Our mission, truly, is to honor all stories in a way that Wynton Marcellus said this, challenges the American mind, opens new frontiers for the American spirit, and preserves the American memory. And that's a powerful and evergreen mission. And the way we del deliver on that mission will continue to change and will always be driven by innovation. John Cow, the author of Innovation Nation, defined innovation as the ability of people and companies and even nations to continuously create their desired future. But our desired future will never show up if we don't, as Newton Minow advised, prepare a new generation for great decisions. If we don't invest in knowing and learning, in connecting to one another through our stories and music and art. And the fact is, the tragic fact is that we now have one million young people failing to graduate from high school every single year. They are unprepared for life, for work. They're certainly not prepared to make great decisions. So the message that my grandfather shouted at those young men decades ago, stay in school, graduate, is a lot more complicated to comply with today. One year ago, CPB, building on our success in education, invested through America's public media stations to address the dropout crisis through an initiative called American Graduate, Let's Make It Happen. The most important word in there is let's, let us. Today we have 68 stations in 30 states working with over 600 community partners using broadcast web and mobile platforms to focus on what has been identified as the dropout factories in their communities and help keep those kids on the path to a high school diploma. Recently, and I want to thank Hugh Price again for being part of that initiative, recently Chris Rock was interviewed on what I think is one of the most outstanding series on PBS, African American Lives, by Dr. Henry Louis Gates. And in this uh, film, he learns that his great-grandfather fought in the Civil War, served in the South Carolina legislature, and died owning dozens of acres of land. And he said, Chris Rock said, that although he is extremely successful today, if he had only known about this family story, it would have taken away the inevitability that he was going to be nothing and he would have had the confidence to stay in high school. And I'm just so proud of the fact that through public media and the American Graduate Initiative, we have an opportunity to really communicate to young people of all races that they have potential, that they can find strength in their heritage and have a story eventually worth listening to. The evergreen mission of public media is to always be contributing to our collective sense of what it means to be an American. And for that alone, I really believe that American public media is of value and service to this country, and that the federal investment in this service is vital. So 40 plus years after President Johnson signed that act, 
creating America's public broadcasting service, the tools of communication and media have changed. The technology continues to evolve, but this great network of knowledge, trusted information, lifelong learning has evolved as well, and it's still here, available to everyone. No fee, just free, right now. It's called public media, and it's worth the pickle. Thank you. We're going to take some questions. There is going to be a small reception. There afterwards. can't be any questions. I've answered every possible question. <laughs> There's that sense of humor again. Uh, and strength, <laughs> Italian-American strength. Yes, right here. Yes. The funding, there are different methods of funding, and some stations are connected to universities, some are owned by the state, and the majority of the funding comes from the state. And I uh, realize that this is being broadcast, <laughs> um, and I want to be very careful what I say. The challenge that I alluded to is that we're in a pincer movement right now with this economy. And as governors and state legislators look at where they're going to cut and save, uh, there's an expression, penny wise, pound foolish. So what has happened in New Jersey, there was an alternative solution where the station in Pennsylvania and the station in New York came together to ensure, because we are supposed to ensure universal service. We are looking, CPB is looking at all kinds of ways that stations can collaborate, that money can be saved. But at the end of the day, and it's why I said sometimes you have to do the counterintuitive thing, when it looks like it's the time to get rid of something, you better take a look at what you're getting rid of and how you're ever, ever going to replace it. Another question? I would get, try to get, so we get picked up on the microphone. Um, yeah, first of all, I want to thank you for public broadcasting. I've been a member in a variety of states since 1980. Um, and uh, also, I'd like to put a plug in for my friend's PBS program in the Rocky Mountain region yeah. that won 17 Emmys. It's called the Big Green Rabbit. And Charlie was. Charlie, well, this is this goes to what you say about yeah, yeah about education because this program is really the Sesame Street of the environment, or teaching kids on how to relate to the world around them, the environment, climate change, where they fit into this larger world they're growing into, and the Big Green Rabbit was the most popular. Um, character at the uh, White House Easter egg hunt. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I, I, a new character in, in the um, uh, child uh, arena. Um, but the question that I have has to do with truth in broadcasting and your um, take on the somewhat recent um, decision in Florida, the appellate Supreme Court and Fox News uh, actually fighting for the right to say that news does not have to be the truth. And it doesn't, it seems like that story has not been, uh, hit, the, hit the media as it should have. It, yes. And it impacts, yeah. it, it impacts everything that we know about media. The interesting thing, as, as we have all of these uh, technological tools and we can express ourselves and we can uh, react to stories, sometimes the reaction to our story becomes the story. And so at a time when newspapers are going out of business, um, part of the challenge is how do you get the real story, the story at the state house, the school house. And what we have done to ensure that professionalism within journalism is a, is a hallmark of public media, we've created um, local journalism centers. And this is public radio, public television, working together on a local level, online, um, on air, and focusing on local stories that can become national stories in specific areas. It could be about immigration, it could be about the environment. And they are beginning to win prizes. And now I have to tell you, many of the people who are part of the, we call them the LJCs, are journalists who were let go from the, you know, 
the, the papers that, that went out of business. And also, the, the point about NPR and the foreign bureaus and how sometimes the news of the world uh, is only made available through NPR in these remote areas. And at a time when commercial bureaus are really hmm, either disappearing or cutting way back, I don't even think that's a story most people know about NPR, the investment. We just gave them a $500,000 grant and some of that money is going for body armor. Um, they are there. They're doing an amazing job. It, it is such a public service to our country. And yet, at the same time, they don't really toot their own horn. So if we don't have the facts, we're not informed. I like to say that public media puts the civil back in our civil society because of our attention to really true journalism. We have another question back here. Um, thank you for your comments and the information on, uh, on uh, what goes on behind the scenes. I, I have a question on a little more details on the funding. You mentioned 15% comes from the federal government and the rest is raised by the individual uh, stations. Mm -hmm. But of those stations, to, to my knowledge, correct me if I'm wrong, they are allowed to raise money from private corporations. They just can't advertise on the show. So oh, underwriters. They, yes, they yes. can. Yes. So what percentage, I know it's going to vary, but what percentage comes from private corporations? What percentage comes from individuals? And the 15% is the, from the, the federal The vast government. majority, depending on what kind of affiliation the station has, but the mass, vast majority of funding comes from, as it says on PBS, individuals just like you. So it's a very interesting, complicated, someone said Byzantine system. We give the federal appropriation is delivered via a formula. And it, they're called community service grants. But in order for the station to get the community service grant, they have to show that they're really connected to the community. So they have to raise money that it, it indicates that the station is delivering a service to the community in a very specific way. When a station can't raise that money, they don't get their community service grant. So the checks and balances on American public media should really make the American people feel very confident and happy. And I would love to see in Congress a big chart showing how we're doing this on a shoestring and how it is fiscally managed. And it's also what I call a virtuous circle. The money from the federal government, which is just enough, some would say not enough, um, to get the whole thing started. And then the station has to go out and connect and raise the rest. In terms of corporations, there's so many regulations on how those corporations can be acknowledged. So they cannot be interrupted. You can't have them interrupting the, the program. Uh, underwriters can be uh, mentioned at the beginning or at the end. There are individuals, major donors, who can also be mentioned. And you have to be very, very careful, as stations are, that you don't violate any editorial integrity connected with money coming from A or B or C. And um, it has worked for 40 years, 40 plus years. And just like to confirm, your, you, your dollar twenty nine was a per year. Dollar thirty nine. Dollar thirty nine. Oh yeah, not every per year. five minutes. Right. Yes, I yes. was going to say not even like no, monthly no. fee for, on for, iTunes uh, or or such. Less than you'd pay for a latte. To have a question here. Hmm. I never ask questions, but I will now. Um, so I love public media. So thank you for uh, everything that you do. Um, but one of my questions was to just tag on to the funding issue. Is there a way for the stations to, um, with the advent of digital and how much is digital, is there a way for the stations to save money? And I know that this gets into accessibility issues mm -hmm. and, and whatnot, um, but with people having much more access to digital than they used to, is there, are there savings to be had there? You know, like so many other media entities, um, Public media hasn't monetized what they do online, but we are online. But again, the children's apps that we have, they are available for free. 
there are reasons we are very, very different, and the financial model that may be, you know, that's why when you said we're sort of the venture, venture capitalists, not, not quite, because the money has so many strings attached to it. What you can do, what you can't do. But we venture are, capitalists require a lot <laughs> <laughs> and when they lend out their money. No, but stations are different. looking online and, and various ways to um, monetize certain things. But then you have to be very careful. Does it undermine really the mission overall? It's a mission-driven entity. I guess I'm not talking about selling things. I'm talking about towers and, you know. Oh. Oh, absolutely. No, absolutely. absolutely. You know, that sort of thing. Exactly. We have uh, invested a great deal in a master control plan where economies of scale, uh, actually in, in New York, where stations come together and they can use one entity. So when we go to the Hill, mostly when I go to the Hill, and they say, well, you're overbuilt or it's an archaic system, we've already started working with stations on a lot of ways to save money. But, you know, at a certain point, we don't want to be in a going out of business sale. We can save a lot of money, but the idea that it's public service media Right now at a time when people can't afford the cable bills, there is a lot of new people who are coming on board who really need this service. And at a certain point, it is what it is. So the funding is so critical. It, uh, let me just have one question over here before I will take a question. Thank you. Great Hi. student in my class. Oh, thank you. Oh. <laughs> Hi. Um, so my question was, um, oh, thank you. My question was um, if, you, if there is a relationship with the Department of Education um, and what sorts of things is your organization doing to sort of um, provide more um, education opportunities for students? We have a history of work with the Department of Education. Our Ready to Learn program has been funded um, by the Department of Education. And now we've taken Ready to Learn um, into a whole new digital world. It's been measured. It's been evaluated. Um, it's such an important program. And if you could just read some of the testimonies from parents whose children have gone through the program, either through stations, uh, camps, summer camps, or um, Between the Lions was another show. That early first start is so critical. And there was a study done that showed that children in middle to upper, upper economic level in, in those families, at a certain age, they have a vocabulary of, of, of words that are so much more than kids who are in high poverty uh, communities. And yet, through Ready to Learn and some of the early learning programs through public media and the Department of Education, those kids catch up really quickly and start soaring. And it makes all the difference when they get to first grade. So our programs take these kids before they even get into kindergarten. At the other end, through American Graduate, we're looking at kids in middle school because there are indicators that tell you who's going to drop out. Well, there are indicators before then. And I'm not saying that public media is going to be able to solve the dropout crisis, but part of the problem we have is that these kids are floating out there with nobody caring, with really no expectations. So from one end, we have early childhood. The other end, the American Graduate Initiative, which we kicked off actually um, at the museum in Washington, D.C., and then we were part of a program at the White House and then with Secretary Duncan, we're working with America's Promise Alliance and the Gates Foundation. And I'm very hopeful ab about this program because it's on the ground, community-based. And then the content, of course, and the awareness is national as well as local. Other questions? In terms of the funding, how optimistic are you then in the midst of this battle and of uh, thrown and the fo forces uh, talking about reducing the deficit and uh, austerity and, and such that, um, that your budget becomes mm -hmm. again 
a, a, a sacrifice uh, to the fact that we need to cut something and, and why not cut this amount? It's just hanging there. Well, first of all, we're very grateful to the president for supporting our budget request and his budget. And also, this gets in a whole other realm, but I don't think you can lead anything unless you're optimistic. No one's going to follow anybody who says, whoa, this is really terrible. <laughs> um, so we have to, in, in many areas, uh, do what we are doing. We have many, many, many supporters on both sides of the aisle. We are aware, of course, of the, this economic pincer movement. But I do think we have to talk in, in, in a more connected way um, about public media today and what public media is doing and how to replace it, especially on, on the education side, <coughs> would be um, impossible. So I'm very optimistic. And given the, uh, the charge of some of elitism and, and such, uh, as I hear your story, most of it is in terms of multiple communities, poor communities, rural communities. It's not uh, a socioeconomic demographic of, for, of, of your funding, of your ventures, of what you think of, no. of an elite. It's, it's broader. You have some statistics well, on that? Well, I created, with the help of our board, um, and a strategic framework called the three Ds, digital, diversity, and dialogue, to ensure that we tap into the talent represented by a changing demographic in this country. So you bring in the new Ken Burns. You bring in people who are speaking in a way to different communities. And it's their public media. Public media can only survive telling America's story, and America's story keeps changing. So in terms of, I don't answer questions. This is probably none of you remember. There was a. Um, comedian a long time ago, Henny, Hen, Henry, Henny yeah. Youngman, Henny Youngman, and he had this terrible joke, have you stopped beating your wife? And if you said yes, it meant that you were beating your wife. And if you said no, it means you hadn't stopped. So I really, really do not answer those questions of is public media elitist because you're going down a rabbit hole that has no end. We are consumed by 170 million Americans. If you could read some of the letters most recently, one person said, you know, I don't know why they think that people who listen to NPR are living in a bubble or elitist. Now, it's true. They do have a high uh, level of uh, graduation rates from college. But it's almost patronizing to say that people of all different heritage, races, and economic levels don't have an innate curiosity about our world and have every single right to have that information come to them unfiltered and be able to have the facts so they can make decisions about their lives and understand what's going on in a very complicated planet right now. So I think that is a the elitist charge is something I just brush off because it's not true. And we're reaching 99% of the American people, and we're as different. It's not one size fits all. Also, we have to be very careful that we don't fall into this trap of because <laughs> you may learn something, it's a bad thing. I don't know how we got to that place, but we ought to get out of there pretty quickly. <laughs> We have another question over here. Pat, how are you and your colleagues at CPB and others in public media industry thinking about the tension between the importance of local stations and radio and television as sort of the heart and soul and connectivity to the community with the reality that technologically a lot of the programs that are <coughs> funded nationally and supplied nationally could completely bypass local stations and be streamed and blah, 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 blah. What is the future going to look like? given the evolution of technology? Well, the interesting thing is that people want to feel connected both locally and nationally. And so at night, if I'm watching television or I'm watching Charlie Rose, um, maybe this is a bad analogy because I live in D.C., which isn't exactly the best local example. 
But you want to feel connected to your community. So you don't want just what I'd call the mall version of the news. You want the local version. You want the high school football team. You want to hear about what's going on with the school board. You want to know why the traffic is going one way or they're not picking up uh, the garbage. All, you want to know in terms of elder care, what, what are the services you can have in this particular community. At the same time, we're going to be connected more and more and more on a global level. And I think it doesn't really matter about the technology because as we're standing here and sitting here, it's changing. It is the content, the content that is going to connect us and help define who we are. Right now as Americans, I think we are wondering a lot. We're wondering if the American dream is going to be available for our kids. We're wondering what it, what it really means to be an American. And we're wondering if we should be hopeful about the future or very pessimistic. We're not a pessimistic people. But if we don't have the information that we need in a timely way, if we fall into the Lotus approach of, and I love commercial, I feel I have to say this, I love commercial television, mm -hmm. um, but not commercial all television the is a friend time, of yours. not all the time. And if that's self-forgetting that you tend to do um, continues, and that's the only fare you have, um, it's going to be a very, very sad thing. And local, local, local is very important to public media. And I think it defines us, and it will be there in the future, even though it may look very so I think different. part of the question was, are you, don't you have other initiatives and other, other medium of, tra of, of transferring content Oh, digital? Yeah. Did you have the three Ds or? <laughs> no, no, that's not three D. No, 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 no. three digital. Uh, I, I no, was no. reading on the web, uh, the website. No, that that's just your, your uh, an alliterative uh, way to remember right. our commitment to diversity, to digital, yeah. and to dialogue engagement. Well, that's three D. Mm -hmm. Those are the three, but it's not three D. I know. I understand. I was just trying to just give me a very I'm hard to have time. Your, I'm right trying now. to have your sense of humor. No, uh, <laughs> some sense of humor right here on the back. I, I have a question that you may not even want to answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, regarding what kind of pressure or influence is there today on editorial content? Uh, because, for example, uh, you mentioned that you know education seems to be not so prized as it used to be. And so, to give you a good example, global warming. There are scientists mm -hmm. that say, many scientists, you know, People of uh, a lot of education mm -hmm. have a position, but in the media, there's debate on whether that's true or not. So how much editorial content is being pressured to steer a certain way or another? I can only speak uh, <laughs> from uh, my position on the receiving end of many calls and emails. And some days, we will get emails about one program and total disagreement. You didn't tell the truth, it's this, or you're, you're too left, or you're too right. Every station has a code of editorial integrity. We've just invested in, and still are, um, an editorial integrity initiative that does a deep dive, uh, providing guidelines for stations. But it's why I mentioned Frontline earlier. Frontline is probably one of the more would you say controversial programs because of how they spend so much time getting the facts and putting it out there on subjects that are sometimes very difficult to watch. And occasionally there will be a phone call. Um, I didn't like this, you know, and our response is too bad. Maybe you'll like the next one. So being from Brooklyn helps a lot. <laughs> That's all I'll say. We got your back. We have another question here. Um, I, I was listening to you worrying over the word elite and elitist, mm -hmm. and I think it's a very apt word because it describes the perception of most people, most mm. Americans out there. If you look at the educational standing we have in the world, mm. and if you look at the decline of education, and if you look at television, I've come back from being overseas for 10 years, and I'm still in culture shock a year and a half later. 
and you see the level of shows all across the board that people watch which does not ignite their intellectual curiosity mm -hmm. and the people so many of them young people who don't read and they'll tell you I don't read sure they read the internet but they don't read books so what we have in your in PBS and these programs is intellectual curiosity depth all the things you don't find outside the mm -hmm. one show I'm thinking of, and there may be many others, that really cut through all that to everyone are shows like Sesame Street. It, kids from all backgrounds know Sesame Street yeah. and talk about it. Somehow it combines the humorous and the charming with the intellectual learning. So I, 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 I love every program you have, but if there could be more like that that could reach more people where they live, <laughs> where yeah. they can laugh and learn at the same time and compete with what's out there, it would be wonderful. I agree. You're, you're being cheered on. Is there <laughs> any? And I think we have time for one more question. Otherwise, yes, right here. It's not wrong. I don't no, care. No, we got her, you know, we got her. She's at the right price, free, so. Uh, First, I would like media. to I just uh, wanted to free. I wanted to say that I, I watch PBS and I love it but I am so flattered at you guys put on a show for sign language. Yes. There's a children's show. Yeah. Are they going to yeah. put any more on there? Or is that yeah, in point? fact, that goes um, way back. Um, programs for the hearing impaired and um, you mentioned Sesame Street, Muppets with Disabilities and, you know, the Again, it, it just goes to diversity, and diversity isn't just about race, it's, it's age, um, and it's people who um, are able-bodied and those who are not, and um, we're able to do it because there isn't a bottom line. We, we don't have to cut for a commercial and sell something. But more and more, uh, some of the, the issues we're getting into, uh, people might say, well, is this appropriate? for young children to talk about. And um, the way that Sesame Street, and I'm using them as the primary example, it's all research and it is all based on what young children can absorb and what actually has impact. Uh, bullying is another uh, example right now and not just handicapped kids, but overall and some of these uh, issues are the things that young kids are facing today. So our connection to the overall American family with all of our various different things going on um, is even more important now. So yes, the answer is yes. I don't seem to be able to give a short response. Um, I feel another speech coming on, so maybe we better let you guys go before. Well, this, this speech has been brought to you by the letter S, <laughs> and uh, we uh, appreciate your time and enlightenment, and thank you, Empire Thank State you, University. Joseph. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.